And so I don't want to take up a lot of time, so I want to get straight into it. I've been working on this sermon for months, y'all. So I'm ready to just get it out. And so I want to start out by sharing with you the story of when I made a decision that put me in one of the most riskiest situations I've ever been in my entire life. And that was when I was giving birth to my first son, Justice. Okay, so what had happened was um, I didn't know how it worked. I was pregnant. um, And I asked the doctor, I'm like, are you going to be the the one to give birth to my child. This is going to be like the movies that, you know, my water breaks and I call you and he said, yes and no. Yes, if I'm on call that day, no, if I'm not. I said, well, we need to make sure it's you because I read the reviews before I picked you, okay? I'm the kind of person, I don't know about you, that when I'm going to buy socks on Amazon, I'll spend 20 minutes just reading all the reviews because I'm not trying to spend my money on something that's not worth it. And so I asked him, I said, I need, you need to be the one to give birth. I mean, to not give birth. I give birth. You need to be the one to deliver my child. And so he said, well, what we can do is we can induce labor. And so what basically that means, if you don't know about this, it's crazy, but they inject you with a hormone that mimics what it would be like if you were giving birth. Like the hormone that women's release whenever they give birth and they break your water. And so I'm like, okay. And so you mean I could schedule this? And he said, yes. I said, well, I'm all about control. And I want to, I'm like, let's do this. So we scheduled it the day after Valentine's because we still had to have our Valentine's. We didn't want his birthday on Valentine's. So his birthday is February 15th. We get to the hospital and he says, the process, you should, you, you should be like giving birth within eight to 12 hours. I said, awesome. And let me tell you, y'all, this did not come out the way we expected. Okay. He broke my water. He injected me. Eight hours, nine, 10, 11, 12 hours passed. No baby. And let me just tell you, for lack of better words, my body was just not open and willing to give birth to this child. I told my son I was going to share this story, and he's like, Mom, that's TMI. And I'm like, all for the gospel, okay? i would be vulnerable if it means people come to Jesus. So my body was just not ready to give birth to this child. So then more hours passed, 13, 14, 15 hours. At that point, I've been tested beyond my limits. I am tired and I want this baby out. Well, 20 hours passed, y'all. I was in 20 hours in labor, which is not supposed to be when you induce labor. The doctor ends up walking in. I think he just wanted to go home, but he told me, he's like, we're going to have to do an emergency C-section because your child is going to what we call distress and he's going to lose oxygen and he can pass away. And so if you don't know what a C-section is, that basically means they're going to have to cut me open to take this baby out. I got so nervous. I threw up all over myself because that's definitely, I see my mom have a C-section. I didn't want that. And then they started injecting me with more medication to get my body ready for surgery. It was doctors coming in, nurses. It was a hot mess. And then my husband, I knew I had made a crazy decision when my husband looks at me and he was scared. Y'all, my husband doesn't get scared easily. There's only two times in my life that I've seen him scared. One, whenever he proposed to me, okay, because he just, he's good with words, but that day, I don't know what happened. <laughs> he was like, I just want to be with you the rest of my life. And when we, hit, we went zip lining, he went zip lining in Costa Rica because I checked it out. But that day he looked scared. So I knew the decision I made put me in a serious situation. And I also realized that by asking the doctor to do this procedure to induce me, it came with a process that I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting to walk into the hospital that day. I knew it was going to be tough, but I didn't know it was going to be tested beyond my limits. I didn't know I was going to have to wait so long. I didn't know I was going to be cut open. And I don't want to scare you with this story and not have children, okay? Because what came out of it was awesome and powerful right? But I didn't expect that. And so the thing is, prayer is a lot like that. We come to God and we ask him for things, right? But we don't realize that the process by which he answers our requests comes in a way that we don't expect. Sometimes what he does with us is he tests us. He makes us wait a long time. And sometimes he opens us up. He examines us and he takes out of us what's time to take out of us. This whole year we've been talking about prayer and how awesome and how powerful it is and all the great and awesome things that come out of it. But sometimes it comes with a process that we don't expect, right? Sometimes there's things that happen that we don't realize or that we're not expecting to happen. And so I want to share with you today, unlike my doctor who didn't really prepare me for what could have happened and didn't set my expectations right, I'm going to tell you the truth. Praying and asking God for things was never meant to be safe. So that leads me to the title 
of my talk today. I didn't know prayer was dangerous. I didn't know prayer was dangerous. And prayer is dangerous because when you ask God for one thing, God often answers it in a way that you didn't ask for. And there are things that we think we want, but we don't want what they come with. So maybe you're here today and you've been asking God for patience. Yo, I've been asking God for patience since I gave birth to this child. But instead of giving you patience, he gives you annoying employees at work. And you're like, God, but I ask you for patience. And he's like, yes, I know that you did. And the best way you're going to get patience is if it's tested. Or maybe you're asking God for a more intimate relationship with your spouse. But instead, you find out that your spouse is battling an addiction. And you're like, God, but I asked for a more intimate relationship with my spouse. And he said, yes, I heard you. But the most intimate relationships are those without secrets. And if you're here today and you hear this title and you're like, but why would I want to pray if prayer is so dangerous, right? I, my son asked me that the other day. He's like, what's your title? And I told him, he's like, mom, but why are people going to want to pray if prayer is so dangerous? And I get it. Nobody wants more annoying employees at work. Nobody wants to find out that their loved ones are battling addictions. But the reason why it's still, we still need to pray is because it's worth it. I might have gone through what felt like hell that day giving birth to my child, but I have my promise. I have my gift. He might not have come in the way that I expected, but I have him because prayer might be dangerous, but not only is it worth it, it births. It births life. It births freedom. It births restoration. It births healing, redemption, miracles, and life change. So it's still worth it. And in my experience, Prayer is dangerous and also crazy. I'll tell you, in my house, every time we do prayer and fasting, something happens. I, we've been praying, we've been praying, I've been praying and fasting even before I met Pastor JJ, probably a year after um, I started serving God, always in the beginning of the year. But every time we do prayer and fasting, something happens. And I feel like we should start calling it prayer and breaking because something always breaks in my house. And so I'm just going to go down the list. Our pipes broke twice. My car broke a few times. Okay. That was when I found out that my husband was battling with an addiction to pornography. The sister that I was praying for God to heal passed away. All that happened when I prayed. So then you might be thinking, then why are you still praying, Pastor Liz? Because you know what else happened? My pipes that broke, one of the two sets of the pipes that broke, it was going to cost $10,000 to fix. And God miraculously came through and brought a $10,000 bill down to $1,000 because you know your girl can't afford no (laughs) $10,000. Not only that, one of the times my car broke down, I say one because it was a few, it was my engine that blew. Y'all, the extended warranty on my car, it was going to cost $10,000. I don't know what it is with $10,000 in me. It was going to cost $10,000 to fix the extended warranty, covered it, y'all. And you know them extended warranties don't always be covering your cars, right? Can someone say amen to that? I'm sorry if you work for those companies, but they were asking me for oil changes for like the past 20 years. I'm like, your girl does not have that record, but they still covered it. And my husband, that was was battling an addiction to pornography was set free, you guys. And this is during prayer and fasting. And then you might say, well, you pray for your sister to be healed. And she passed away. What happened? Well, God showed up in that too, because Pastor Alana, shout out to East Campus. I know they're, they're probably shouting now. Shout out to East Campus. Pastor Alana um, showed up to my house with a letter, not knowing that I had been praying for God to heal my sister. And, she, and in the letter she wrote that God hears your prayers and he knows that you are praying for her to be healed, but he, he's actually healing her in heaven. And so it was a new perspective that was brought to me. And then on top of that, I had a brother that had been estranged from my family for over three years. He hadn't come to any of our family functions. Thanksgiving was always sad without him. And because my sister passed away, he came to the funeral after not seeing my family for three years. And his relationship with my father and my whole family was restored. And that was because prayer is work. Prayer is dangerous, but it's worth it. And as much as those prayers tested me, I wouldn't have changed them. I wouldn't have done nothing different. They were painful, but powerful. They were breaking, but life-changing. There were times where I felt defeated, but I always ended with a win. So today, I want you to experience what I experienced. So what I want to do to you, 
teach you today is three different prayers that are dangerous but are life-changing. They're prayers that will challenge you but change you. They will check you but redirect you. They are prayers that will reveal some things in you but also heal you from them as well. Are you ready, church? Are you ready? It's going to get dangerous up in here, up in here. I got a little hood in me. So the first dangerous prayer, if you're taking notes, is search me. Search me. Psalms 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is David and he's praying and he's saying there's two things that he wants God to search him for. And the first one is his anxious thoughts. He said, search me and know my anxious thoughts. And he's saying anxious thoughts because he's referencing fear. But more importantly, he's saying, search me because he's talking about the fears that he doesn't know that he has. Did you know that? Did you know that there's fears deep down inside your soul that you did not know that you had? That's why we have to go to therapy, y'all, because we have to ask, what is, can you dig deep down inside and, and see what is it that I'm so afraid of? And they have to go to your past to see what's going on. And if you're here and you're saying, why does it matter? Why does God need me to pray, know my anxious thoughts. Doesn't he already know my anxious thoughts? He does. But do you know your anxious thoughts? And more importantly, do you realize that those areas in your life that are fearful or that you're afraid are areas in your life that you have not surrendered to God? I wrote it this way. What we fear the most often reveals where we trust God the least. What we fear the most often reveals where we trust God the least. And I'm not talking about the fear of snakes or spiders or of the dark or the man behind the curtain that's not really there, but we always check before we take a shower. That's not what I'm talking about. (laughs) I'm not talking about the fears that keep you out of the attic or the bushes or the dark. I'm talking about the fears that keep you out of the will of God, out of the destiny and the plans that he has for your life. So what is it that you're really afraid of? What is keeping you up at night? Are you afraid of losing your job? Are you afraid of not getting married by a certain age? Are you afraid of being stuck in the same marriage? Are you afraid of the future, of failing, of the unknown? What are you really afraid of? If I'm scared that my marriage isn't gonna work, then I'm not trusting God with my marriage. Because again, what we fear the most often reveals where we trust God the least. If I'm, not, if I'm scared that I'm not gonna be able to pay the bills, then I'm not trusting God with my finances. If I'm afraid and always overprotective of my kids, there's nothing wrong with protecting your kids, but being overprotective. You're afraid every time they walk out of your house, then that says that you are not trusting God with your kids because what we fear the most often reveals where we trust God the least. So I've been praying this prayer lately because I wanted to practice all these things that I'm teaching you. I've been praying, God, search me. What are my anxious thoughts? And I realized I'm okay in regards to finances. I'm not afraid with my finances. Um, I'm getting better with my kids because, I mean, before I wouldn't let them go nowhere. And my mother-in-law laughs sometimes too because I was always calling them every time they were over her house. Are they okay? So overprotective. I'm, I'm good with that. But what I realized that I'm afraid of is with my health. And so recently I started getting these heart palpitations and they would happen at night during the day. I would wake up in the middle of the night with just my heart racing. I went to the doctor. They did blood work. They, they, they put a heart monitor on me for like three days to figure out what was going on. And they were like, your blood work looks good. We do see you're having heart palpitations, but we don't understand why. And so then I just, I started to get afraid because I'm like, what if something really bad is going on? And I don't know. And it didn't help that I read this book about this woman who her husband, they kept taking her to the, taking him to the doctor because he has all these medical issues and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And he ended up finding out that he had a brain tumor and passed away. And so I would end up waking up in the middle of the night scared thinking I'm going to die. Y'all like, that's how afraid I was. I even started coming up with like contingency plans. I'm like, all right, so if I die... A lot of stuff is going to have to happen because I do a lot in my house. Like they're, they're going to need to pass the JJ and the kids are going to need a chauffeur. They're going to need a cook. They're going to need a stylist because God knows they can't dress themselves. And that's why he looks good on Sunday. It's me, y'all. Okay. And thank you. Uh, if anyone wants me to be their stylist, hey, like side hustle. 
also, he's going to need a, a therapist because he goes to therapy, but I'm like his in-house therapist, okay? So I'm like, There's gonna, they're going to need a lot. And then I realized, like, I'm a pastor. I'm not supposed to worry. And, 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 and I started to just be more and more afraid. And then we went to Encounter Night here. So if those of you who don't know, it's a service that we have at night. Miracles happen. All these people are getting healed, and I'm not. And I'm still having heart palpitation. I remember going home that day, and I told my husband, maybe God just doesn't work that way in my life. Like, I've had lost a child, had so many miscarriages. I have scoliosis and now I have heart palpitations. So I'm like, maybe God just doesn't work that way in my life. I went home that day. I prayed and God spoke to me and he said, Liz, you're acting like your son. Cause that's how God talks to me. Like just straightforward. He's like, you're acting like your, your, your kids. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he reminded me of the, the first time I took my son. I'm not going to say who, cause I don't want you guys bothering him, but <laughs> And also I have to pay them $5 every time I tell them a story. So if I don't say the name that I'm, <laughs> I don't have to give them $5. <laughs> but anyways, so my son, I took him to Disney for the first time and um, we, took, we got on all the rides he wanted to get on. We got him a Mickey ice cream cone and then we got him a toy from Disney, y'all. Those toys are expensive, okay? We got him the toy and then on the way home, he's like, Oh, we want to, I want to stop at the Dollar Tree. And I'm like, no, bro, I'm tired. Like, no. And then he was like, he threw a fit. And I'm like, do you not understand? Like, we got you the toy from Disney. Like, did you forget? Like, did you forget that we got on all the rides? Like, we were at Disney. And you're crying because I didn't give you a dollar store toy. And then that's when it hit me. God was telling me, did you forget? Did you forget all the times I've healed you? Did you forget when you were 19 years old, you got into a car accident where you should have died and the cops looked at the accident and they said, I don't know how you survived this accident. And then he told me again, did you forget? Maybe you have scoliosis, but did you forget that at the gym last week, you just deadlifted 250 pounds and squatted 200 pounds? That's unheard of for someone who has scoliosis. And that's when it hit me, God was like, Stop thinking about what I haven't given you and realize that I've been working things out in your life. It might not be the way you wanted to. It might not be the way you expected, but I'm doing it in your life. So I want to tell you again, stop focusing on what you didn't get and start focusing on what you did. Did you forget? Did you forget about that time you were worried about paying your bills, but then God came through and you're tax return was a lot more than you expected it to be? Or did you forget that the doctor said that you couldn't have a child, but you had one anyways? Don't forget. When we don't forget what God has done in our lives, and we're not so anxious about what we're afraid of when it comes to the future. And it's not just our fears that God wants us to search. There's more. The Bible verse says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. But he also says, see if there's any offensive way in me. In other words, uncover my sins. If you're like me, you're good at accusing others, but equally good at excusing yourself. So I can point out your faults, but then I can have a perfectly good explanation as to why I would do anything that you would consider offensive. So this is me. This is what I tell my kids. I, I struggle with anger issues. I've gotten a lot better, but sometimes I still, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, so I still be yelling at my kids. <laughs> But I tell them this, I don't have a temper problem. I wouldn't yell at you if you wouldn't do what you did. It's not my fault you make me so mad, right? Or we say things like, there's nothing wrong with looking at porn. Everyone else does it. Besides, I'm not hurting anyone. It's not my fault. It's so easily accessible. Or this one, I'm not gossiping. It's not my fault that people confide in me. <laughs> Besides, I'm just passing along information so that people know what to pray about. Or, I'm not selfish, I just like nice things, it's not my fault, I have money and they don't. So, I've realized something, that the areas in our lives that we're the most defensive about are usually the areas in our lives that we need God's help to work on the most. I wrote it this way, whatever I'm defensive about is usually what's offensive to God. And this prayer, search me, is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because when you start to pray, God, search me, God is going to start revealing it to you. He's going to show you your fears and your offensive ways. And he's not going to do it in a beautiful handwritten note with a heart stamp or a DM. And he's not going to text this to you. The way it's going to come out, the way it's going to reveal itself to you is through panic. Sometimes it's going to look like anxiety. Sometimes it's going to feel like being triggered or it looks like crying or it could look like insecurity. And it's going to look like someone calling you out and you being uncomfortable about it. 
And this is good because the only way that it's going to get out is if it comes out and you deal with it. So pray, God, search me, know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me so that he can pull out what needs to come out. Amen. Amen. Come on, right. Now the next dangerous prayer for me is the hardest one. And that one is praying, break me, break me. James 1, 2 to 4 says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Again, I have the hardest time with this one. Why would ever, anyone ever want to pray, break me? Why would we ever want to invite danger or struggle or attack? And I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't like when things are broken. I so don't like when things are broken that my husband, we own our home. So that just means that he's a handyman, okay? And he has, I have an app where I put down everything that I want him to fix in that house, okay? That, the list is long. And for those of you who want this app, the husbands are going to be upset. And she said yes, because every time my husband talks about it, I get like 10 women and men too, because they're like, my wife is going to do that one, asking me about, it's called Nosby, okay? So it's, you just write down everything that you want your husband to fix. And everything has his name, because I'm not going to fix, and that's his job in the house. I mean, <laughs> ladies, we can fix things too, but I, I don't want to. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyways, people don't like when things are, I don't like when things are broken, neither do people, okay? Like, you could look at Facebook Marketplace for that, like, and you would know, because a couch that usually costs $2,000 is like $100 because it has a broken leg, because nobody wants things that are broken. But you know who likes when things are broken? God. Yeah. There's a Bible verse that actually says God is near to the brokenhearted. Wow, he likes when things are broken. On top of that, he likes to break us, okay? And that can sound so cruel, but I promise you, there's a reason why. Going back to the Bible verse, it says, let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. And the best way I can illustrate this is with my son Justice and his relationship with roller coasters. Now, I, t I said his name on this story, okay, because I asked him for permission, all right? And I think he's, he's doing media today too, so I got you, $5, okay? <laughs> he told me too, almost in tears, he's like, Mom, you guys, you have to tell Dad to stop sharing these stories because they're so embarrassing, okay? You don't have to start asking me permission. I'm like, all right. So anyways, my son, when he was little, we realized that he had a fear of new experiences. Like, it was so bad that when I went to potty train him, and we, I, I'm telling you I got permission for this, I promise. We put him on the toilet, and he cried, y'all. Like, he cried. And I'm like, why is he crying on the toilet? And then I realized, I mean, he's this little body in this big hole that can go down. And so I'm like, I get it, buddy. I get it. So I had to, like, hold his hand. But... Um, he, he realized that about himself, that he was afraid of new experiences. And so he, in his own way, he asked us, he's like, can you help me with that? And so um, around that same time is when we started taking our kids to amusement parks, which by the way, I know you're thinking, you're like, dang, they go to the parks a lot. I'm like, I know, okay, is that we're pastors, okay, we can't get drunk, all right, we're, we're not going to eat a lot because we're into fitness, so we go to the amusement parks, okay, that's what we do. <laughs> Anyways... So we did what any good parent would do to help him with this problem. We forced him on a roller coaster, okay? So we get on the roller coaster. We're going in the line for the roller coaster. And he's crying the whole time he's in the line. He's like, no, oh, am I going to die? I'm going to die. And I'm like, you're not going to die, buddy. Do you see that scale right there? Like, they're not going to allow you to get on this ride if you're not tall enough for it. Also, mom and dad are going to be with you, okay? You're not going to be alone. Um, and when you get out of this watch, it's going to be better for you. And so that didn't matter that I said any of that to him because he cried the whole time he was on the roller coaster. I wish I could show you the video because it's kind of funny. And he, he cried and he cried. But then he got off and he was like, oh, you know, like I can, t and then every time we get on it, we get better. Like if I could show you the video of like the first time and then like the 10th time. Okay. Yes, we did it like 10 times. Not that same day. Okay. I'm not torturing him. But every time he would get on a ride, he would have more confidence and new experiences, right? To the point that the other day we went to Universal, those rides are big and all his friends were chickening out and he was like, no, I got this. Like, why? Because he experienced it before and he knew that he could do it. Now, the reason why I share this is because I want to encourage you, stop being scared over breaking and trials. 
if God allows these things in your life, it's for a purpose. First off, he's not going to allow you to get on a ride that you're not tall enough for. I.e., he's not going to allow you to go through an experience or a breaking or a trial that you're not ready for. And second, he's going to be with you the whole time. He's not going to leave you alone. And third, you're going to be better for it. So you could be mature and complete and not deficient in any way. Now, I know some of you are new to Journey Church. Uh, maybe you've heard the story. Maybe you have not if, you, if you've been here for a while. Um, and I had mentioned it before that we lost a child before starting the church. And so I remember going through that traumatic experience and just wanting God to heal my child. And he didn't. Um, the, the, the miracle came through when the fact that we didn't fall into a depression whenever we lost our child. It was like prayers of the people of the church who, who really sustained us. It was like when you go bowling and, and the guardrails stay up, you know, and, and you don't fall into the gutter. That's how we felt. And so I just remember going through that trial and it, it being tough, but God was my sustainer through the whole time. And so what it made me realize was God is going to be my sustainer then. And then whenever we decided to start the church, I realized I could do it. I could face this trial. It was like looking at a roller coaster and saying, I've been here before. I can do this because God is my sustainer. So that's what I want to encourage you with today, church, that if you go through breaking or you go through trials, it's so that you could be mature and complete and lacking nothing and know that he's going to be there for you. And for the same reason, we put justice on that roller coaster so that he can gain the character you need. God does the same thing with us. I wrote it this way. God cares more about your character than your comfort. So if you're struggling with a broken heart from your last relationship, it could be that God's trying to build your character so that your next relationship is your last relationship. Or if you're struggling with the brokenness of a lost job or a failed business, know that he's instilling in you the perseverance to sustain that even better job or that successful business that he's going to bless you with. Again, God cares more about your character than your comfort. And see it as a gift, like the Bible for it says. It says in James 1, 2 through 4, again, consider it a sheer gift. Because a lot of times people say that. Why do good thing, bad things happen to good people? Right? Or, or maybe you're going through a trial and you're like, why did God allow this to happen in my life? Considering the gift, it's because he knows that you're ready for the trial and you're going to be better for it in the end. And praying break me is really dangerous because it challenged you. But again, the result is a gift. You will be lacking nothing. Amen. Come on. And the last dangerous prayer I want to encourage you to pray is send me. Send me. And this is when we tell God, here I am and do whatever with me that you want to. And it's a dangerous prayer because he can call you to move to another city or maybe he can ask you to stay where you are when you thought you were ready to leave. Or maybe if you're dating someone that you know God has been telling you to break up with and he asks you to break up with them, right? But then he gives you an upgrade. So hey, somebody can say amen to that. <laughs> I told my husband I was going to share this. He was like, babe, make sure they understand that it's when you're dating, okay? When you're married, that's it. That's, that's, you're not breaking up, okay? Don't say amen to that. Or maybe he might lead you to a different job or serve somewhere, or maybe he'll lead you from being a cat person to a dog person. I don't know. No more cat litter. I don't know what he would ask you to do. But when we pray, send me... We're just being available to God. So it's a dangerous prayer. And when you pray, send me, and God tells you where he wants you to go or what he wants you to do, there's two responses. Either you could say, yes, Lord, I'm going to do it. Or you could say, here I am, Lord, but send someone else. Like Moses in the Bible, for those of you who are new to church, Moses was a man that God spoke to him through a burning bush, y'all. Like burning bush. That means he knew it was God talking to him. And God asked him to helped the Israelites come out of Egypt because they had been slaves for over 400 years to lead them out of Egypt. And what he said was, no, can you send my brother Aaron instead? Because I stutter and he's better at speaking than me. And that's a lot of times what we do, right? We say, I'm not going, I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. Someone else will be better at this or I'm not going to give. They should give. They have more money to give. They should be the one to give. Or I don't have as much time. I work. She's a stay-at-home mom. Ooh. And all the moms will come out of the house with no makeup and a knife ready to cut you because we work too, okay? It's a lot of work. 
But that's what we say, right? She can do it, they can do it, not me. And sometimes we say, Lord, send someone else because we're afraid that God's gonna ask us to do something big and crazy, like, like go to Africa to be a missionary and never use the toilet again another day in our life, which he might do that. But you know what else he might do that's more likely? It's more likely that he's gonna ask you to be a missionary in your own job to your coworkers, that's what's more likely. Or ask you to be a missionary or love on your friends and your family members or that person that's bagging your groceries in the grocery store. People think that he's, God is gonna ask us to do something crazy when we say, Lord, send me, but he just wants us to help people who are hurting. Maybe pay $10 for a lunch for a single mom of five kids. And to you, you might say, well, that wasn't a big thing. But to that mom, she would say, that was a really big deal. And to God, he would say, yes, that's a big deal because you were faithful in the little. Yes, come on. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened to me when I prayed God send me. I prayed God send me, and I said, and then when he told me what he wanted me to do, I was like, don't even think about it. <laughs> so I'm going to share the story of how God spoke to me and when we decided to start this church. And I know you've probably heard this story if you were in Next Steps, but I have no shame in saying it again because this is the reason why we started this church. This is the mission statement of our church. But there's a part that I don't share in that pretty little video, okay? And that was when God told me what he wanted me to do, I said no. Why? I never wanted to be a lead pastor of a church because my father was a pastor of a church and his father was a pastor of a church. And I saw everything that they went through, y'all. It was hard. Like, my dad, he wasn't even paid to be a pastor. He, he had side businesses, but I saw everything that he went through. And as a kid, I remember just seeing him cry sometimes because he poured out his heart into people and they broke his heart and, and they walked away from him and they said bad things about him. And I just didn't want to go through that to the point where when I was a teenager, I walked away from the faith because I felt like people in the church were hypocrite and I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And so God changed my life. Obviously, I got radically saved. But then it led to this day. It was a day when God spoke to me. I was on my way to take my kids to the doctors. I was in a rush. I stopped at the gas station and there was a man walking around asking for money. And I felt in my heart like I should help him. And so I told him, I don't have cash, but I have my credit card. I can go ahead and pump gas for you. And so I started to do that. Um, and his wife was there and his kid, and I realized there was pillows and blankets. So that, by that, I, I mean, he must have been sleeping in his vehicle. And his car, like, it was old. I don't know. It, it, it was a lot of gas, okay? So I'm there pumping gas. I just remember being there for a while. But then I, I just started to minister to him, and I told him, you know what? God must really love you because he made sure that I stopped so I can help you. And all of a sudden, he just started to cry, and his wife started to cry. And I prayed for them. And he told me, I'm, I'm driving around because I'm looking for a job. I just got out of jail. And, and, and these words really helped me. And I'm like, well, you should come to my church. Um, again, I told my husband, oh, actually, I didn't tell you guys this part. When we were dating, I told my husband, I, you could do anything else in ministry. You will never be a lead pastor, okay? <laughs> That's how God works because I'm standing here. But he, he was a youth pastor. <laughs> yeah, he was a youth pastor at the time. And so I told him, you should come to my church that my husband and I youth pastor at. Well, they came to the church, y'all. I remember the day they walked in, we were doing Holy Communion. I was standing on the stage um, with the other pastors and I just started to cry. Cause I'm like, they came, John and Rita, they're here, babe, that's them. Those are the people I invited off the street. And then they came, they sat down. My husband happened to be preaching that Sunday, which wasn't always the case. It was like maybe once a year. And that happened to be the Sunday he was preaching. And I watched the whole thing happen. Like they're there and they're crying and he's preaching. And he asked if anyone wanted to raise their hand and give their hearts to God and their lives to God. And they raised their hand. And at the end of it all, I sat down with my husband at the end of the service. And I said, babe, this is crazy. Like I invited these people off the street and then they came to church. And now their life has changed because they have Jesus in their hearts and I'm like I think I can give my life to this like I don't care about the hurt that might come okay because some people they hurt people are people but I'm like I care about John and Rita these people who need Jesus and I'm like babe what if he's like what are you saying I'm like what if we started a church where Jesus could be accessible to anyone and that became the mission statement of our church y'all and now we're here today but that all started because I stopped and I pumped gas for somebody. Like, what? We're here today. And I'm not saying that because it's me, okay? Because I fought God on this, if I'm honest. 
But when we pray, God, send me, it's those little things that make a difference that can help somebody. I wrote it this way. When we are obedient to God in the little is when the big happens. So maybe he'll prompt you to serve in the church. Maybe he'll prompt you to serve in the nursery, which is like going to Africa because they don't use a toilet. <laughs> maybe he'll prompt you to lead a small group or to give above your tithe or, or to foster, or to pay for somebody's bill, whatever it is, just do it. Amen. And this prayer is dangerous because God might call you to do something that's completely out of your comfort zone. Standing here is out of my comfort zone, but I do it. Because when I said God send, when I asked God to send me, He said, This is what I wanted to do. And I said, God, I'll do it. Amen. That's the word. If we can all stand. Come on. I usually end on a really hype note, crying with emotions. <laughs> but today, the true change is going to happen Come on. throughout the week when we pray these yes. three prayers. Yes. So I put all of these prayers on the screen. Search me break me and send me. And I want you to just take a moment and, and, and look on the screen and ask yourself, which one of these prayers you need to pray? Because it's for all of us. And again, if I'm honest, the one I have the hardest time with is break me. So this week, I'm dedicating myself to praying, God, break me. So what prayer are you going to do today? Is it search me? Are you saying, God, there's some hidden things inside of me, some hidden worries or anxieties or fears that need to come out or some offensive ways, or maybe for you it's break me. Maybe you're ready to change, get out of that relationship, or, or maybe there's some areas in your character that, that you need God to work on. Or maybe it's send me. Maybe something inside of you is saying, I want more of God and, and I want to do what God has asked me to do. So I want to ask you today, if you would commit for just the next seven days, to pick either one of these prayers or all of these prayers. And if that's you, and if you say, yes, Pastor Liz, this week I'm gonna pray either search me, break me, or send me. If that's you, if you could just raise your hand, just as an indication of it, thank you. Yes, wow, there's a lot of you. If we can all bow our heads, because I wanna pray for you, you could put your hand down. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for all these people that are here today, God. Lord, I pray this week, when they're spending time with you, even if it's just a short, on the way to work and they're saying, God, send me. Send someone to me that I need to speak to or maybe it's search me. Maybe they're arguing with their spouse because there's just deep hidden worries or anxieties that cause strain on the home. I pray right now that you would help them when they pray, search me. Search deep inside their soul and show them the areas of their lives they need to work on or maybe it's break me. Maybe they need to break out of a relationship or a habit or, or they know that there's some character flaws that they need you to help them with. God, I pray that you will help them with that today, God. And with your head bowed and your eyes so closed, I wanna talk about one more dangerous prayer. I know I said there was three, but there's actually one more. And that's the prayer of salvation. That's a prayer where you ask God into your heart. And if you're here today and you say that you feel like my son on the roller coaster, but you feel alone, Maybe you've been doing life alone and you're going through trials and situations and you feel like you're alone through it all. I want to tell you today that you've never been alone. God's always been there with you on that roller coaster. He's just waiting for you to pray this dangerous prayer that says, join me. And if that's you today and you're like, man, I've been doing life alone and I need Jesus. Understand it's a dangerous prayer because there's changes that will happen here in your life on earth that will be challenging, but it's worth it because of the changes that will happen in your internal life. Jesus died on the cross for you, for those anxieties and sins that I talked about, and he wants to join you in your life. And if that's you, maybe you prayed this prayer a long time ago, but you kind of walked away from God, or maybe today is your first time. If that's you and you say, I want to accept Jesus into my heart. I'm tired of doing life alone and I'm going through these roller coaster rides and I want you with me. If you want to pray, join me today. On the count of three, I want you to raise your right hand to the sky as a sign and a symbol yes. and saying, I accept you in my heart. Yes, come on, Lord. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hand down. Church, if we could pray this prayer with those who raise their hand. Father God, Father God today, I realize I've been doing life alone. 
Today I ask for you to join me in my life. I will follow you and everything you have for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give it up, Journey Church, for all those people who made a decision to follow Christ? Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez, and we wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, don't let the journey stop there. We love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all, subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.